Guests of honor, former Deputy Prime Minister Dr. Tony Tan, President of Singapore Management University, Professor Anna Di Meyer, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning and welcome to this public lecture series organized by SMU's Sim Kibun Institute for Financial Economics. I'm Gladys Ng from the Institute and I'll be your MC this morning. We are deeply honored to have former Deputy Prime Minister Dr. Tony Tan here on SMU campus to give a lecture on a topic very close to the hearts of the public and especially of those gathered here today. We are also honored that your response to this event has been so overwhelming that besides this auditorium, we also have guests seated in the media theater watching the lecture from a video screen. For those unable to be present with us right now, this morning's public lecture is being filmed and will be made available on social media platforms. With this large crowd waiting in anticipation, we should get started and to move us closer to the reason why we are all gathered here this morning, please join me in inviting on stage to give his welcome address, SMU President, Professor Anna Dimeyer. Um, good morning, Dr. Tony Ten, uh, our guest of honor today and former Deputy Prime Minister. Distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, students uh, in this lecture theatre, but also in the other lecture theatre. And in a sense, since we live in a modern world, I also should probably welcome the people who later on may see this lecture as a podcast um, and say that we actually are happy to have them with us too. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this uh, uh, public lecture of the Simki Boon Institute, uh, Simki Boon Institute in, for Financial Economics, that was named in honor of, uh, I would say, one of the uh, pioneers uh, of Singapore, one of the people that helped build this country. Um, and uh, since its launch in uh, 2008, the Simki Boon Institute has been developing and applying research on financial economics with a very special relevance to Singapore, Asia, and Asia. Uh, we have four centers, uh, one for financial economic, or econometrics, one for silver security, one for asset securitization, uh, and a center for corporate and investor responsibility. But part of the mission of the center is also to organize uh, a number of lectures and to engage with industry and the public. And it is for that reason that we have this public lecture series, public lecture series under the banner of the Institute. And was, as were already said, today we are most honored to have with us uh, former Deputy Prime Minister Dr. Tony Tan to address us on the futures of higher education. Uh, in this particular case, I don't think we have to think about financial futures, but more about building uh, the future of this country and actually probably even more than, than this country alone, uh, planning for the future through education. And uh, Dr. Tony Tan is probably one of the best people placed to uh, address this particular issue. Um, it's always a bit embarrassing to go through the, the, the CV of somebody who's so well known and who has contributed so much. And so I've decided not to go through the whole, uh, it's not that it is not necessary to remind you of all the achievements of Dr. Tan. But given the fact that we today talk about education, I thought that I would highlight a few of the elements in his uh, curriculum that have actually to do with education. And uh, it's always good to remind us that actually Dr. Tony Tan started as a scholar uh, in universities. Uh, he got a first class honors degree in physics from the University of Singapore. He obtained his master's degree at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and a PhD at the University of Adelaide. And he later lectured mathematics at the University of Singapore before starting to work at OCBC in 1969. And after a decade at OCBC, where he held, last held a post at that time of general manager, Dr. Tan entered parliament in 1979, and he was made senior minister of state in the Ministry of Education before joining the cabinet in 1980. In the same year, he helped to establish the new, and this was already then that he started to establish its universities, the new National University of Sing Singapore, and served as its vice chancellor. And he served in the cabinet as Minister of Education, Minister for Trade and Industry, Minister for Finance, and Minister for Health. In 1991, 
Dr. Tan returned to the private sector and rejoined OCBC as the chairman and the chief executive officer. And in 1995, Dr. Tan was asked to return to the cabinet as deputy prime minister and minister for defense. In 2003, he became the first coordinating minister for security and defense while retaining the post of deputy prime minister. In, 19, in 2005, Dr. Tan stepped down from the cabinet and took on several positions. And as relevant to this today's topic, uh, related to the development of academia and research, in particular, he uh, was is the chairman of the National Research Foundation and the deputy chairman of the Research, Innovation and Enterprise Council, and also uh, the chairman of the Education Ministry's International Academic Advisory Panel. I had the privilege in my last 10 months in my position as president of this university uh, to attend several of these meetings, among others in the DT International Academic Advisory Panel and the board of the National Research Foundation. And I was always very impressed by um, the knowledge that Dr. Tan has of not only what's going on here in Singapore or the region, but the knowledge of what's going on in the best of uh, academia and education worldwide and how he has been able to select some of these uh, characteristics, the best characteristics of educational systems, and bring them uh, here to Singapore. And of course, here at SMU, uh, we are very uh, much thank or grateful to him because it is that abiding interest in the education sector that actually made SMU happen. Uh, without him, we wouldn't be here. Um, let's face it, if SMU is where it is today, it is, for not, it is for his vision, his openness to change, and his commitment to quality. From the outset, and I remember because I was at that moment in Singapore in a different uh, uh, position, but from the outside I remember that Dr. Tan had envisioned the third university, SMU, to be very distinctive from the two existing universities. He supported us always in being distinct. We started out as a public funded autonomous university and this paved the way for the others to follow suit. We decided on offering our own degrees. He was with us in doing that. We wanted to offer not just business management but also law and social sciences. Again, he encouraged us. And Dr. Tan's guidance enabled us to do many things differently and distinctively, from admitting students holistically to emphasizing an all-round development of our students. I actually dug up one of the uh, lectures he gave here before, in 2004, it was probably still at our Bukatima campus, when at SMU's first commencement, Dr. Tan was our guest of honor. On that occasion, he said, and I quote, from its conception, SMU was designed to provide a different model of ed university education here in Singapore. We wanted to start with a clean slate, instead of just adding another public university in the mold of the existing ones. And from this starting point emerged a confluence of factors that made SMU very special. Today, 11 years on since our first batch of students, we are focusing on taking university to the next level. We are not going to stop innovating. We are advancing towards our goal of being an internationally recognized top Asian multidisciplinary research university in the world and serving the world of business and management. Towards this end, we will build value-creating partnerships with the industry and also with the universities here in Singapore. It is an exciting journey still ahead of us. Therefore, I'm looking forward to hearing Dr. Tan's thoughts on the higher education sector or the education sector in general. And of course, I will listen very carefully in order to understand how we as uh, SMU can contribute to it and to be part of it. Therefore, it gives me a very great pleasure to invite Dr. Tan on stage to deliver his address. Dr. Tan, please. Professor 
Hello, Lee Mayer, President of the Singapore Management University, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I would first like to thank SMU for very kindly inviting me to speak at the Sim Ki Boon Public Lecture Series. I would also like to thank all of you for coming to this lecture this morning, not only the uh, people who are here, but the students who I understand are listening to this lecture in another uh, lecture theatre through video streaming. Thank you all for taking time from your very busy schedules uh, to come to this uh, lecture. This morning, I'm going to talk about something which is uh, very close to my heart, and that is the futures of higher education. There is, uh, I'm saying, no spelling error here. <laughs> In deciding on the topic, I decided to use the term futures because there is no single vision for the future of higher education, whether in Singapore or elsewhere. And the reason is simply this. The future is unpredictable. The only constant in today's globalized economy is change. We cannot therefore plan for the future by extrapolating from the past. Instead, we have to have frameworks which make possible a variety of paths depending on how the future evolves. For example, many of you undertaking studies at SMU today will not have only one career. You will have two, three, perhaps four careers during your working life. I also want to make clear that I'm talking about not only university education, but higher education generally. In Singapore, higher education comprises three types of institutions. First, the Institute of Technical Education and its colleges. Second, the polytechnics and third, the universities. This is why I've asked SMU to ensure that Polytechnic and IT students and their faculty are invited to this event. And I hope that uh, the lecture will be of interest to them also. My lecture this morning will be in three parts. And you can conveniently think about them as the past, the present, and the futures. The first part looks back at the development of higher education sector in Singapore and the vital role that higher education has played in Singapore's economic and social development. I will then outline some of the current trends in higher education and the challenges that we presently face. And finally, I will look to the futures. I should also preface my speech by saying quite evidently that I'm not the Minister for Education. And therefore, it is not my job to determine government policy in this or other sectors. And what my words today are those of a private citizen. But based on my involvement in higher education in Singapore for over three decades, I would like to share in the speech later on three fundamental principles which I believe should guide the formulation of higher education policies that will benefit Singapore and all Singaporeans. First, the past. Ever since Singapore's independence, higher education has been the cornerstone of our strategy for growth and nation building. As a small country with no natural resources, our only asset is our people. It is therefore imperative that we invest heavily in their development to enable every one of our citizens to realize his or her potential. Our higher education sector started just over 100 years ago with the establishment of a College of Medicine in the British tradition in 1905. And this was followed by Raffles College, which opened in 1929. 
and both became part of the University of Malaya in 1949, from which the University of Singapore was established in 1962. The tumultuous period leading up to self-government also saw the birth of the first Chinese language university in Southeast Asia, Nanyang University, in 1956. The Singapore and the Nian Polytechnics were established in 1954 and 1963, respectively, to equip Singaporeans with practice-oriented skills needed for Singapore's growing economy. And so in the first years of an independent Singapore, our two universities and our two polytechnics prepared young people for new careers in industry, commerce, and other professions. By today's standards, however, access to higher education was limited. Less than 3% of the cohort were admitted to these institutions in 1965. Most young people at the time started work without post-secondary education, with some not even completing secondary school. The government also invested heavily in primary and secondary education during this period. In the 1960s and 1970s, industrialization was Singapore's main economic engine. By the late 1970s, our economy was confronting a new set of challenges, including competition from low-wage countries with a plentiful supply of labour. During the 1980s, Singapore began to shift from labour-intensive activities to more capital-driven and higher value-added industries. We were moving up the value chain, and needed to train our people to keep up with these developments. Nang University was merged with the University of Singapore in 1980 to form the National University of Singapore. The Nanyang Theological Institute was set up in 1981 with three entering schools, and this later became the Nanyang Te Technological University, NTU. By the 1990s, the global economy was changing again, with a growing emphasis on innovation and a knowledge-based economy. And to take advantage of this, we created a new institution that was closer to the American style of broad-based education, which we hope would capture and foster the entrepreneurial spirit in Singapore. And this institution was, of course, the Singapore Management University, or SMU. Today, our universities enroll over 50,000 students, with a university cohort but participation rate that has grown from 5% in 1980 to 26% in 2010, and this will increase to 30% by 2015. To achieve this rate of increase without lowering standards is a significant achievement by any standards. In parallel, the polytechnic sector grew rapidly from two polytechnics prior to independence to five polytechnics today. And these five polytechnics, Singapore, Nian, Temasek, Nanyang, and Republic, trained 43% of the cohort in 2010. The Institute of Technical Education, ITE, has similarly come a long way since its rebirth as a post-secondary institution in 1992. ITE is a critical pillar of our education system, providing industry-relevant training to 22% of every cohort. IT now forms an integral part of the higher education sector in Singapore, ensuring that no young Singaporean leaves our education system without the skills he or she needs to make a living. Now, over the last few weeks, I've been asked more than once whether I favor a Singaporean's first policy in higher education. And the simple answer is, 
I do. What I understand from this is that Singaporeans can be put first. Whatever initiatives we launch, we must always put the interests of Singaporeans and Singapore first. But Singaporeans first is different from saying Singaporeans only. Singapore is an international city and it would be a grave mistake to close our doors. While putting Singaporeans first, we should not make it too difficult for international talent to come to Singapore. Finding the right balance is not going to be easy, but we must try. I understand that some people believe that the higher education sector should only educate Singaporeans. In addition to the inherent problems of protectionism, however, closing our doors would limit the talented individuals who presently contribute much to Singapore. Closing our doors would also restrict our ability to engage in a kind of collaborative research that has put Singapore universities in the very top ranks of universities in the world. And there is another reason not to close our doors. We live in a region in which Singapore enjoys many advantages. As a small country, however, we have a strong national interest in helping to raise the standards of governance across the entire region. Positioning our institution of higher education as part of a global network with alumni going on to leadership positions around the world, positions Singapore well and secures our relations with other countries and brings further benefits to Singapore. Having said that, we must always remember that our primary responsibility is to Singaporeans. To give Singaporeans and their families every opportunity to be first, to be the best that they can be, and to find their own paths. To that end, Singapore citizens have priority entrance to primary and secondary schools, and this lays the critical foundation for success in higher education. Many subsidies and scholarships are available to Singaporean students to pursue higher education here or abroad. To ensure that Singaporeans can take advantage of opportunities, the government should continue to monitor carefully the proportion of foreign students in our educational institutions to ensure that the proportion matches the present and future needs of the country and that Singaporeans are the main beneficiaries of our education policies. In retrospect, what we have achieved, although there is much we have achieved, but what we have achieved in our higher education sector over the past decades may be an easier accomplishment compared with the difficult tasks that lie ahead. Up to now, we always had role models. We could aspire to build our infrastructure and our human resources to first world standards, thereby differentiating Singapore from the other countries in the region. But today, as the International Academy Advisory Panel noted at its meeting last September, Singapore is no longer playing catch up with Britain, the United States, or anyone else. We have caught up, and today we have to start charting our own path. This now brings me to the second part of my lecture on the trends and challenges that we now face. And let me highlight three trends. First, we are witnessing 
unprecedented growth in developing countries, most notably China and India, with greater integration of these economies into the global economy. This puts increasing pressure on Singapore to maintain a highly skilled workforce that leads the region. Achieving this requires ability, but also flexibility, so that we can upgrade our skills or develop new skills entirely. Only by doing so can we stay ahead of our neighbours who have greater natural resources and larger manpower bases. Second trend. The demand for goods will grow as the economic pie increases in size, but it will grow in ways which are difficult and hard to predict. Rising affluence will fuel the growth of an increasingly specialised services sector to cater to a variety of tastes. This in turn will lead to the creation of new classes of jobs, notably in the services and entertainment sector. For example, jobs as social media manager, search engine optimization specialist, and even professional blogger. <laughs> These jobs did not exist even 10 years ago. But today they exist and uh, they are very well paid jobs. As someone who has overseen a large media company's move to, em to embrace the online platform, I can tell you that it is an exciting time, particularly for young people. Those of you preparing for the workforce will be confronted by a wide range of new and exciting occupations and careers. Most of the attention tends to be paid to high-end jobs, and it's understandable. But at the other end of the social economic spectrum, there are 4 billion low-income consumers in today's world. As we have seen in China, and to a lesser extent in India, many of these people will successfully aspire to higher income levels with an accompanying expansion of demand and consumption. The third major trend is demographics. The increased affluence that I've described will be accompanied by change in life expectancy as well as lifestyles. People will live longer. People will have longer and more diverse careers. In some countries, the aging population, or as you call it, the silver population, because of the hair, I think, <laughs> will put pressure on the social safety net. In other countries, this demographic shift presents an economic opportunity if one can accommodate the medical and lifestyle challenges that it raises. As I said earlier, many of you will not have one career. You will have two, three, maybe even four careers. Sometimes the reasons will be economic to go for a better job. But there are also many people who change careers for self-fulfillment. I was reminded recently, for example, that Mr. Willin Lau, the chef owner of uh, the restaurant War Rocket, gave up a lucrative career in law to set up his own restaurants, which are now very successful. I'm sure that Singaporeans, being the food lovers that we are, would welcome more of such mid-career changes, although we also need lawyers, of course. <laughs> the challenge for higher education today, then, is to be more flexible. But without compromising the standards of excellence in education, for which Singapore is well known. I now come to the third and final part of my lecture. 
what do the futures hold? One thing is clear, Singapore must remain an open society, even though you'll face even more competition in the years ahead. As a young nation, we must also continue to focus on nation building and strengthening social cohesion. As I've said, I'm not the Minister for Education, but nevertheless, I hope it will be helpful if I share some thoughts about the foundational principles which I believe should guide the next phase of developing higher education in Singapore. And I see three such principles. The first principle is comprehensiveness. Our institutions of higher education must collectively aspire to offer the widest range of programs to the widest range of people. The multiple pathways that we offer through the ITs, polytechnics and universities must cater both to the needs of the economy and the inclinations of our learners. Each pathway should have the necessary scale to cater to a significant proportion of each cohort, but there should also be scope to mount courses in areas of large demand and also in areas of emerging or niche demand. IT is, for example, beginning to distinguish each IT regional college. While NUS and NTU remain comprehensive universities, each is also expanding its range of courses on offer to new institutions such as the Yale and US Liberal Arts College and the Lee Kong Chian School of Medicine, respectively. As with uh, SMU, which specializes in business, management, and the social sciences and law, Singapore's fourth university, the Singapore University of Technology and Design, SUTD, will offer a novel, multidisciplinary curriculum with a strong focus on design thinking, innovation, and entrepreneurship. While Singapore places a strong emphasis on science and, te and technology, we are increasingly aware of the need to promote the arts and culture in Singapore. To this end, our arts institutions, La Salle and the Nangi Academy of Fine Arts or NAFA, have played an important role in developing skill manpower for the arts and creative industries in Singapore. For individuals, this principle of comprehensiveness means learning widely even as one develops specialist skills. Steve Jobs, one of the founders of Apple, is an interesting example of this. You will not believe the subject which uh, he enjoyed most when he was in college. And this was, of all things, calligraphy, not computers. At that time, he thought that this was entirely separate from his interest in computers. But years later, however, Apple produced the first computer with beautiful typography, changing forever the way we think about computers and publishing. So what may appear to be a rather trivial interest at this time of your lives may turn out to be a game changer as you grow older. So don't give up hope. The second principle is flexibility. We need a system that is flexible and allows for a network of bridges and ladders that can link the various pathways. In the past, higher education has often been linear. Once you begin down one pathway, there was very little prospect of switching to another pathway. That is a very narrow view of education and a very limited view of human potential. And in the future, it will be untenable. Education, especially higher education, should offer a range of opportunities to all. People develop at different paces, 
and many will need or want to switch paths. In some cases, this might be seen as offering second chances. But more generally, we need to ensure that our learners are flexible and nimble, able to seize opportunities and to capitalize on them. A second chance is, after all, only a chance, unless you can identify it and seize it. The newly established Singapore Institute of Technology is an initiative that provides upgrading opportunities for polytechnic graduates to quality industry relevant, relevant degree programs which are established in partnership with overseas universities and the polytechnics. We must also build on our continued education and training CET programs to prepare our workforce for a more dynamic future and a longer working life. This includes upgrading programs such as part-time diploma and degree programs in the publicly funded institutions as well as private institutions such as UNICEF. Another example is the Duke NUS Graduate Medical School which takes in students which, who have a basic degree in a variety of disciplines, but nevertheless feel passionately about medicine as their calling. Earlier this month, I attended one of the NUS graduation ceremonies and spoke with one of the students. He was a little older than other students. He was 35 years old. I asked him about his background. He told me that he had served as a colonel in the Singapore Armed Forces, but realized eventually that his dream was to practice medicine. So, despite having a very promising career in the SAF, he gave up his military career and enrolled in the graduate medical school. He's graduated and soon he will be fulfilling his dream of practicing medicine. The third and final principle is openness. We must ensure that our institutions are high quality, but also open and connected to each other and to the world. In a world of tough new competition and scarce resources, our institutions must leverage their local, regional and global networks to attract and retain the very best students and faculty, prepare local students for global careers, and to be at the cutting edge of research. All our institutions of higher learning now have exchanges and immersion programs that allow students to spend time in overseas institutions. These must continue and grow. Four centers of innovation now support local research and development initiatives at our polytechnics. IDE's Global Education Program sends about 3,000 students abroad every year. Centers of Technology promote deeper collaboration between ITE and industry. And at the university level, the National Research Foundation's Campus for Research Excellence and, te and Technological Enterprise, or CREATE for short, offers open spaces for research interaction between NUS, NTU, and SMU, and leading overseas institutions. And the Ministry of Education and the NRF have established research centers of excellence to undertake cutting-edge research in areas such as quantum technologies, cancer sciences, and the earth sciences. And these collaborations have reaped early fruits. NUS recently developed a method for the early diagnosis of gastric cancer. NTU researchers have discovered that annual growth rings on corals in Indonesia could potentially predict massive earthquakes 
in the region. These are all positive initiatives in the public sector. But an area for greater attention is leveraging of private networks also. Private foundations have always played a prominent role in giving back to society by donating to educational institutions. Recently, the Lee Foundation donated $150 million to the Lee Kong Chien School of Medicine. This trend must continue for Singapore's higher education to secure diverse resources for its future growth. In the future, I would like private and corporate support to extend beyond financial support to include mentorship, research collaborations, and learning opportunities. Just as society and the world have an impact on the face of higher education, good institutions must also have a transformative impact on society. I've spoken at length on the economic role that our high, higher institutions play, but we must never forget their social purpose. Other than training manpower and promoting research and development, which of course are extremely important activities, our higher education sector must also contribute to society. SMU was the first university in Singapore to make public service a prerequisite for graduation. And last year, SMU clocked up its million hour of service by students. Congratulations. And today, many of our tertiary institutions have similar programs in place. The role of higher education is not just to prepare one for a job, but of, for a contributing role in society and for life. Although there is much cynicism in the world today, I believe that idealism and social consciousness is also high, particularly among our students. Our institutions must nurture the idealism of their students into lifelong commitments to work for the betterment of our society. In short, I believe that a comprehensive approach to education that is flexible and open to new ideas is necessary for Singapore's continued growth. But I also believe that these values will enable all Singaporeans to set and achieve their own goals, to dream big, and to live out those dreams. In painting this picture of the past, the present, and the futures of Singapore's higher education sector, I want to make clear that I remain confident about Singapore's future. Yes, the future is uncertain, but the future is not something to be feared. The future is something to be shaped. Singapore today is radically different from the Singapore of 100 years ago and from the Singapore in the 1960s when I completed a degree in physics at our stand, the University of Singapore. We have created new institutions to respond to challenges and to offer new opportunities to current and future generations of Singaporeans. And moving forward, we must continue to offer a comprehensive education to all Singaporeans. We must be flexible, we must be open to new ideas. If we can do this, and I'm confident we can do it, we will prosper, and our students will thrive whatever the futures hold. Thank you for listening to me and I look forward to a good dialogue and uh, for your comments and comments and views. And uh, I would like to hear as much from you as uh, you may like to hear from me. Thank you again very much. Thank you.